Did you know that the English water companies are deceiving the general public? A brand new study that's just come out has revealed the true extent of the conniving tactics that these companies are using to smoothen over the sewage spills that are happening all across the country. I'm here at the University of Manchester and I'm about to meet one of the authors, Professor Jamie Woodward, to find out more. I keep seeing you now, it's three times in, in, in a week after... I know! <laughs> so do I! So Jamie, where are we? What's the significance of this location? Well, we're in... Um, well, actually, technically, we're in the city of Salford here because we're on the right bank of the River Irwell. That's right. But uh, across the other side is the city of Manchester. So this is the River Irwell, which um, flows from Lancashire down through the centre of Manchester, uh, and then eventually down to Salford Quays and runs into the Manchester Ship Canal. Yep. But it's significant as far as my research is concerned because a recent analysis by the Guardian environment team showed that by um, sewage spills per mile, this is ranked as the worst sewage polluted river in England. Nice, nice. And you can kind of see it. I mean, there's some stuff that you wouldn't, is, is more than just litter. I mean, there's... Well, you can see on the banks over there on the trees um, from the recent flood events, there's, there's lots of plastic litter there, but there's also lots of wet wipes and there's lots yeah. of sanitary products that you can see trapped in the vegetation, which is a, uh, a clear indication that large volumes of sewage are coming into the river. Yeah. Now, when the river was flowing at that level, we could say that was exceptional conditions, so those discharges are actually legal. But one of the problems with the River Irwell is that places like Bolton Wastewater Treatment Works and Bury and some of the overflows further upstream from here, they're, they're discharging for hundreds and thousands of hours per year. And so they're clearly discharging when the river isn't at high flow. Yeah. So uh, many of those sites are basically discharging outside of what's their permitted conditions. So they're discharging illegally in many cases. And so your new paper in Nature, tell me about it. Yeah, well that's shining a light on, we have, everybody knows that there's a, there's a sewage problem with our rivers, that the water companies are discharging far too much sewage into our rivers, it's become routine. Um, and that paper has identified a set of tactics that the water industry has been using to deflect blame for sewage pollution. Uh, it was based on an analysis that a, a couple of academics in the United States did, looking at the big polluting companies internationally, fossil fuels, pesticides, uh, tobacco industry, and the sorts of strategies that they've employed to, to um, stymie regulation and to maintain the status quo and to maintain profits. So what are some of the tactics that the water companies have been using? Well, a um, good example is United Utilities, this part of the world. Just before Christmas, the back end of 2024, they had a very strong rebuke from the Information Commissioner's Office because they repeatedly are resisting releasing environmental information and making spurious arguments saying that this environmental information is not in the public interest. So discharging pollution into Lake Windermere, how can that not be in the public interest? Right. Yeah. right. Another example from a personal point of view, um, we published a peer-reviewed paper in Nature Sustainability in 2021, which was one of the papers that triggered the sewage scandal. Uh, and United Utilities released a statement that tried to um, undermine our sampling strategy and undermine that research, which is from the classic corporate playbook. It's one of the strategies that that paper had, had identified. What we have under the microscope here are plastic microbeads um, that have been recovered from the bed of the River Tame uh, near Stockport. Yeah. Um, and they're shown on the, on the big screen here. These are about 300 to 500 microns across, so they're all smaller than half a millimeter and they've been picked out of a, a larger sample of microplastics that also includes fragments, also includes fibres. Um, and that's, these are significant because we, these are called primary microplastics. So these are manufactured for a particular purpose. And when you find them in the river and find them on the riverbed, it's a, it's a very clear link with the wastewater system. The only way that these plastic particles, these round particles can get into the river is through the wastewater system. And the only way you can get very high concentrations of them accumulating on the river bed is if wastewater is being discharged into the river when the river's at low flow. So we say that's outside of exceptional conditions. Got it. And what, is, what damage do these do to the ecosystem? Well, um, in this, that's a moot point actually, because these are very, very hard plastics and they, and they don't break down. Um, we have got uh, some evidence that they're getting into the fish populations. Right. But um, from our point of view, uh, the presence of these plastics is, is really interesting because microbeads in personal care products were banned in January 2018. 
but we're still finding very large, very high concentrations of these hard microplastics which are used for industrial processes. So many of these are used in a process called shot blasting, which is used, it's a sort of blast medium to remove paint from body, uh, car body parts, Victorian radiators, bike frames, that kind of thing. Normally that's done under controlled conditions in a controlled cabinet and these, these plastic particles shouldn't be allowed to escape, but to clearly very large numbers of them are, are finding their way into the drainage system and into the sewerage system and eventually out into the river. So as I mentioned, because these are primary plastic particles, they're manufactured for a particular purpose. The point being that they can't have been broken down from larger plastic items in the river. They don't right. form in the river. Um, they're a very clear link with the wastewater system. So that's the kind of smoking gun that links the plastics on the riverbed with, the, um, with wastewater discharges at low flow. So how do you stay motivated to work on this stuff? Because obviously you're fighting these big behemoths of industry and uh, I can imagine that gets a little bit frustrating at times. Well, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this fight on my own. What, what's really interesting in recent years is that there's, there's a number of very successful campaign groups across the country. Mm. Uh, the Windrush Group in, near Oxford, uh, the Ilkley Clean Rivers Group on the River Wall, for example, and, and other examples. Um, and it's no surprise, uh, and Matt, Matt Staniak at Windermere, for example, is a fantastic example. So uh, there's, there's a group of us who um, coordinate activities, supporting one another who recognise that sewage pollution is, is not just a real and present danger to public health, um, it's also slowly degrading our precious riverine and lake ecosystems mm -hmm. and coastal environments. So many of us care passionately about this. And locally in Greater Manchester, um, our rivers are quite small, the discharges are quite low, so they have a limited capacity to accept the sewage and the wastewater from the two million people that live around here. So. The rivers around Greater Manchester, many people care passionately about those river environments, whether they're anglers or dog walkers. And in Manchester, very often, the only green space that you have access to is your local river corridor. Yeah. So it's never been more important to take good care of those environments. And many of them, you know, a little better than open sewers. So many people in Greater Manchester were really bad, like, badly let down by the water company. So over the next five years, what do you think is likely to, to happen with this, with this situation? Well, the water companies have announced a, a transformational investment programme. Okay. And they have targets to reduce the number of sewage spills by, by 2030. Um, so all the investment is welcome. That's yeah. great. That's not going to end sewage pollution. Sewage pollution is going to be a feature of our rivers for, for many decades. Right. But uh, the problem with reducing sewage spills is it's a transparency issue as well. You technically, you can reduce the number of sewage spills, but not actually reduce the volume of sewage you're discharging. Right. Because the monitoring tells us how often a spill happens. The spill frequent tells us how long the spill, um, the duration of the spill, how long the spill lasts. It doesn't tell us the volume of the spill. Right. So I think there's much more scope for the water companies to be more transparent about the volume of sewage that they're discharging. Yeah. And in my view, um, you can only measure industry improvement with confidence if we have more information on volumes of discharges. Because a spill, you'd want to know, is it one litre or a billion litres, right. for, for example? The water companies are supposed to treat the wastewater. Yeah. Uh, and they have a legal responsibility to treat that wastewater and remove whatever's in that wastewater. These microplastics are, I would classify these, they're suspended solids. So like grit or sand or anything else that's removed from wastewater. If wastewater treatment is done properly, you can remove between 90 and 95 and 99 percent of the microplastics can be removed using conventional methods it doesn't need any special filtration and in fact united utilities um, have given evidence to parliament in the past and boasted about the efficiency of wastewater systems for removing microplastics so when we find high concentrations of microplastics on the riverbed it means that wastewater treatment is not happening as it should so with untreated wastewater it's not just microplastics that is in that. It's other stuff as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, sewage gets all the attention, yeah. um, but sewage is part of untreated wastewater, which includes a whole cocktail of nasties, which includes microplastics, microbeads, fragments, fibers, etc., but also includes a whole range of other pathogens, heavy metals, forever chemicals, um, all sorts of pharmaceuticals. So it's really important that the wastewater is treated properly to keep all those things out of our river systems. And this sort of stuff is not something that if you were, if you were in the river having a little swim, like there's no way you, could, you would notice that. I mean... No, this, this, is, a, this is a hidden pollutant. Yeah. 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 But um, once it's, it, the point about these microplastics as well, because they're stored on the riverbed, that's absolutely the worst place for them to be because many creatures will live in the riverbed, uh, they feed on the riverbed or they reproduce in the riverbed. So if the riverbed's contaminated with microplastics, you're maximizing the chance that they're gonna end up in the food chain. 
And politically, this is obviously a topic that's getting talked around a lot, and this was in Parliament yesterday, right? Yeah, well, it was a huge issue in the election uh, last yeah. year. I think, you know, um, a very significant proportion of voters said it was the most important thing that they were, they were thinking about. So there was, there was a lot of hope that the new government would be much, um, um, much stricter on, on the water companies in, in terms of penalising polluting water companies. Now, they've, there's, a, there's a commission going on at the moment, and actually yesterday in Parliament there were various chief executives from the water companies taking questions from MPs, which was good to see. It was very refreshing because uh, typically the chief executives of the water companies avoid tough questions like the plague. They very rarely do interviews. Yeah. Um, they usually send a stooge from Water UK to take the heat. But uh, in my view, um, instead of read, the media reading out these sort of bland corporate statements, um, the water company executives have big enough bonuses and big enough salary packages to, to, to front up on a regular basis to take tough questions and they don't do that often enough. And finally, what can students like me do um, to, who are interested in learning about the environment and helping the rivers get better? Um, how can we help this, this cause? There's lots of ways you can get involved. I'm optimistic. I mean, it, there's, a, there's really good evidence that campaigning works. Mm -hmm. So if you're concerned about your local river, get involved with a local campaign group. If there isn't one, start one. I mean, United Utilities have just announced considerable investments around Windermere, largely because of Matt Staniek's fantastic campaigning up there. Yeah. So campaigning works. Uh, shine a light on poor practice, shine a light on pollution, and uh, the water companies don't like that, and they will respond with investment. But also, I have lots of students in the geography department who get involved in dissertation projects and master's projects who are doing real research on microplastics, looking at sewage data, for example. So there's a number of ways that you can get involved and, and make a difference. So there we have it, a fascinating day with Jamie, and hopefully you learned a thing or two about the state of our rivers. If you're interested in finding out more, there's a link to Jamie's paper and a few other resources in the description. Thanks for watching. Have you heard the term BNOC? BNOC? No, you just asked me that and I said no. <laughs> okay, BNOC, big name on campus. So oh, we're saying that you, you need an escort because you... That, is that a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that a thing that you guys use? So you do need a microscope to identify these. Luckily, we've got a couple of microscopes. <laughs> Estooned on the riparian vegetation. Estooned on the riparian vegetation. Do you like that? <laughs> Getting you on a Thursday morning.